If you were an underwater creature the size of small, how would you protect yourself from being eaten? Well, if you were the water flea, you would do so by growing neck teeth. When they sense lurking predators around, the water flea grows teeth from its neck, but the neck teeth, they are in vain. They are trying to protect themselves from this, the phantom midge larva, which uses cages of bristles and spines to ensnare the water flea despite their neck teeth. And it all happens almost as quickly as anything happens in the animal kingdom. The strike of the phantom midge larva, or glassworm, happens in about a dozen milliseconds. It is only beaten in terms of speed by the trapjaw ant and the mantis scrimp and they are two fast <laughs> bug looking things. So the phantom midge larva is one of the fastest strikers in the animal kingdom that you've never heard of. And boy, do they look evil. <laughs> oh, and then it only takes another 40 milliseconds or so for the midge larva to ingest the water flea despite the neck teeth. So everything happens in less than half the time that you can blink your eye in. You know, life comes at you pretty fast. If you don't stop, and grow some neck teeth for no reason because you're still gonna get eaten by phantom larva, you could miss it. Hello and welcome to another edition of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science where I take all your comments, corrections, and questions and I address them and pounce on them with the alacrity of a phantom larva bristle basket. And then I tell you what's coming up next on this channel. Hint, it's probably the biggest Avengers meme of all time. And we did it. We did it. Whatever it takes. But getting right into it, in the last episode of Because Science, we are trying to figure out just how serious One Punch Man's serious punch is from season one of the anime, just in time for season two, which comes out this week. Super excited for that. I said that Saitama's punch would have to at least equal the attack from Lord Boros that was supposed to wipe off the surface of the planet. And if it could do that by the rules of anime, it would have to have at least a million septi Trillion joules of energy, which is a lot. It turns out it's enough to vaporize 1% of planet Earth or all of the crust. Ho -ho! And if it was in the form of a giant blast of air, as it looked to be, somehow we'll get into it, then it could plausibly affect clouds and the weather and part the sky Tama just like volcanoes in real life do. But what did you have to say? Our first comment comes from Jax Blade, who says, was wondering if you're gonna do this. Oh, okay. How do Saitama's clothes survive all of these attacks? Well, what I like about One Punch Man is that it's not afraid to play around with uh, humor in its characters that are supposed to be all powerful. I believe Saitama had his clothes damaged in his fight with Lord Boros, who was getting all torn up. And when Genos was incinerating mosquitoes, uh, all of his clothes burned off. But you're absolutely right, Jax. If you were really gonna be around energies and heats on this scale, you know, nuclear bomb scale level energies, it would mess up your clothes. Just look at how being near a nuclear explosion vaporized all the paint on this school bus all at once in an instant. That would be One Punch Man's underoos. And then they'd turn to dust, just like Spider-Man. Jen Jen Hocho says, Kyle, stop. We know you don't have the conviction to train like Saitama. We all know how much you love your hair. Saitama's workout routine isn't that hard. That's why it's funny. Anyone can probably do it. In fact, when I was younger training uh, for rock climbing, I was doing like 100 push-ups, 100 pull-ups a day, sit-ups. It's not, it's not that bad. And do you know what happened? My hair only got straight. Wrong. Job G says, uh, Saitama's punch, a serious punch, can cook an uncooked chicken with a slap. Look, you gotta stop. We did the math, okay? You can't cook anything with one slap. So maybe let's change the scale here. What if you had uh, trillions and trillions of tiny slaps happening on the surface of a chicken uh, over time? That's just what an oven does. Air molecules uh, given energy hitting the surface of a turkey or a chicken uh, over time, imparting energy to its skin, and that makes its way to the core of the chicken or turkey, and that's what an oven does. An oven slaps a chicken trillions of times with air to cook it. 
Entman says, hey Kyle, how much energy is needed for the vitrification of a planet like Halo's Covenant ships do? Well, what you are saying, fancily, is how much energy does it take to glass a planet, to melt all the planet's surface? Well, obviously it would be less energy than it takes to vaporize all the planet's surface. And from the sources that I usually use in some calculations uh, that I did, it looks to be about a hundred times less energy than it takes to vaporize the surface of a planet. So 10 to the 28th joules. That's still an absurd amount of energy. It is more than enough energy than it would take to theoretically vaporize all oceans. Just think of how many tiny slaps it would take to vaporize all the oceans. <sighs> David Thomas says, so if three gigajoules could vaporize a person and that's the same energy as lightning, then how do we have survivors of lightning strikes? Well, the simple explanation is that a lightning bolt, though it has gigajoules worth of energy, it doesn't deposit all of that energy into a person. When people survive lightning strikes, they get very lucky because the lightning is using them as just kind of a conduit. It is entering through the top of their head, going around or through their body, out through the bottom of their feet, and then back into the surface of the earth. And you know, the, t the charge is distributed after that. The lightning bolt is not putting all that energy in to a human body. If it did, you can see something like what would happen if you've ever seen a tree struck by lightning, which is larger, has more moisture content, trees explode. If you want to be more technical about it, only a small fraction of the energy of the lightning bolt goes and ricochets around through the body. It does create, though, if we're talking about explosions and vaporizations, a flashover effect where the heat generated by the electricity, the small amount coursing through someone's body after they get hit by lightning, can literally vaporize any water from the rain that might be on their skin or the sweat on their skin and cause a vapor explosion that blows their clothes and their shoes off. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving to Wolfie Gaming, who says, you mentioned Strombolian eruptions and it reminds me, a few weeks ago I studied volcanoes in my college science class and decided to figure out what kind of volcano Mount Doom was from Lord of the Rings. Wolf Gaming goes on to say, because Strombolian eruptions are the most violent kind of eruptions, then uh, one Punch Man would be some kind of volcano incarnate. And because Mount Doom is six times larger than any known volcano of this type, he would have a Mount Doom of a fist. Also, Wolf Gaming mentions that their professor pointed out to them that Frodo and Mr. Sam couldn't even walk into Mount Doom if they tried because of the heat that would have to be inside. So hobbits would have to be fireproof. Sure, why not? But for making the comparison between One Punch Man and Mount Doom somehow, whew, the things we do on this show. You are indeed a super nerd. You erupted. But of course, I'm not always right. Sometimes I don't speak well into the microphone. So what did I get wrong last week? <laughs> what did I get wrong last week? Friends? Our first correction comes from Ogichi Game, who says, something I think people keep forgetting with the serious punch. Saitama's serious punch didn't just stop Boros' final attack. His punch had so much energy that it stopped the attack, then had so much energy that it forced the air towards uh, Boros with enough energy to tear him apart. I'm not sure what the real word math would come out to and say, but by anime logic. I think it means that Saitama's serious punch has to be at least, uh, twice as strong as Boros' final attack. You know what? Sure, anime logic is very weird. I'm just saying it has to be roughly equivalent if it can deflect it because, you know, that's how it works in Dragon Ball Z and stuff like that. But anime logic is really, really weird and their rules, although sometimes internally consistent, are sometimes mind-bending and confusing. I mean, just think about all the weird things that happen in anime. Everything explodes. People's capes move in air, but not their hair. When someone gets cut really cool with a katana, light comes out and then blood. When they're traveling through space in a Gundam suit, a constant thrust means a constant velocity. They're not speeding up. Why? It doesn't matter. Anime logic is weird and wonderful and you can interpret it what you will, but for our purposes, I think just assuming that One Punch Man's serious punch is just equivalent to Boros's final attack and we can go from there. I think it's fine, but you can do your own math. Frequent commenter Infinite Asim and others point out Newton's third law. If Saitama can punch something with another 
enough energy uh, from his fist that it could theoretically wipe off the surface of the planet, then wouldn't he get thrown backwards in the other direction? Yes, from smart boy Isaac Newton, we know that each action has an equal and opposite reaction. So this is kind of like if Saitama was a cannon. If he's able to force that volume, that amount of air away from his fist, it's gonna provide an equal and opposite reaction on his fist, which should theoretically have enough energy to throw him back to the moon. So this is just another one of these cases where we don't really know where all that power, all that energy is coming from because anime. It has to be something weird. Otherwise, he'd launch himself off the surface of the planet. And then what would he do? Jakob Drabent, or Jacob Drabent, says, where is this energy coming from? What would One Punch Man actually have to do if his fist is generating this amount of energy? If it's coming from the kinetic energy of his fist and One Punch Man's fist weighs about the same as a normal uh, anime man's fist, then to get that amount of kinetic energy, his fist would have to travel at more than a few thousand times the speed of light. And that's impossible. That's very true. I did this math myself before uh, the episode, but we did not get into it because anime, again, to get that amount of energy, you would, uh, just from kinetic energy, you would have to have a fist going FTL. And what we uh, understand about the universe so far is that moving FTL or faster than light is impossible. So where is that energy coming from? I don't know. It's very hard to say. On scales like this coming from just a human body, uh, it's probably impossible. But look, Saitama himself doesn't even know where his power comes from. It comes from satire and from writing. That's why One Punch Man is so fun, because not everything is totally possible. In fact, most of it is not. But the nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this episode, I gotta give back to recent super nerd Gwyneth Wynn, who says, wouldn't the shockwave of all that air only propagate through the air at the maximum speed of sound? Cutting through maybe a fourth or a quarter of the Earth's circumference at the speed of sound would take a bit of time. Let's do some math. A quarter of the circumference of the Earth is around 10,000 kilometers. The speed of sound bottoms out at a little under 300 meters per second in the stratosphere, up to 343 at ground level. Most clouds are in the troposphere where the speed of sound is higher. Going with 333 meters per second makes the math convenient. That makes for 20 kilometers per minute. Even if we say that the slice we see is only one eighth the circumference of the planet when Saitama parts all of that uh, sky of the Earth, it should take over four hours to fully propagate and make that slice. That is a fantastic point, Gwyneth. The show and the manga make it seem like instantaneously after the serious punch, the sky it is in an appreciable circumference of the Earth is totally parted, but we know that cannot happen that fast. Even things that move very, very fast, like at the speed of sound, at a certain scale, start to look kind of slow. If we were trying to get just to the nearest star at the speed of light, it would take years. So even with energies like this, if the shockwave is propagating at something like the speed of sound, it would take hours for that panel or for that scene in the anime to actually happen. And for doing the math on that and pointing that out, you Gwyneth are again a super nerd. Ha! All right, now on to this week's episode of Because Science. This week's episode is what would happen if Ant-Man went into Thanos' butt? We did it. That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, we are taking maybe the biggest Avengers Endgame meme of them all and applying way too much science to it and taking it way too seriously. What would actually happen if Ant-Man tried to expand in the colon of Thanos? Would his purple butt be strong enough to take the pressure? What pressure does Ant-Man expand with? Ho oh, ho, we get into all of that, so prepare to learn about the ultimate tensile strength of butt stuff. The internet made me do it. So go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet. All about One Punch Man, Serious Punch. And give me all of your comments, questions, and corrections at YouTube.com slash Because Science, Facebook.com slash Because Science, and at Because Science on Instagram and Twitter. And before we go, just a big shout out to all of you super nerds who came out to see me in my hometown of Milwaukee last week. It was amazing to meet so many of you and to have uh, a number of your families and your sons and daughters ask me questions like, why doesn't the Hulk need glasses if Bruce Banner needs glasses? I love you for asking me questions like that. And now that's definitely gonna be an episode. Stay nerdy.